You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. So we finally made it. TSLV will be the ticker symbol on the Toronto Venture Exchange. We, after today, we will be applying immediately for our OTC symbol to really open it up to all our U.S. investor base. This truly is the number one exploration shot I think I've ever seen on on a virgin project that's never been drilled before. Bulldozers are in place. Excavators are clearing the pads. Drills are going to be ready within 10 days from now to, to, to start piercing the ground. I'm Bill Powers. This is Mining Stock Education. Thank you for tuning in. Well, today, finally, Tier 1 Silver is beginning trading on the Toronto Venture Exchange. So I thought it uh, a good time to bring back on Ivan Bebek, the chair, as well, as well as Peter Dembicki, the president and CEO. So welcome to the show, gentlemen. You can finally say your company is trading. Peter, I want to throw it over to you to start. What more can you tell us? Give us the ticker symbol again. And when should United States investors expect to have their shares tradable? Absolutely. Thanks, Bill. Good to see you again. So we finally made it. TSLV will be the ticker symbol on the Toronto Venture Exchange. We, after today, we will be applying immediately for our OTC symbol to really open it up to all our U.S. investor base. However, if you do have a brokerage account as an American uh, that can trade TSX Venture listed securities, then then you're free to to, to buy as you wish. Okay, so uh, sometimes I ask executives this question, Peter, and they don't like it. So, but I'm going to throw it out to you as a risk. Uh, where do you see the share price going? Well, obviously, we have uh, a lot of dreams and and <laughs> internal bets within the group here of where it's going to open, where it's going to close. You know, nothing's changed. The fundamentals of of the company, uh, all the focus on uh, is on Kurabaya. Uh, it's going to be a, an extreme flurry of activity for the first two months. So. Where is it going to open? Where is it going to trade? That inevitably is up to the market. We have to we have to let the market make that decision. Uh, but uh, you know we have we have high hopes and, and and we know it's going to be a really active stock. That's for sure. Ivan, you mentioned to me in the past that uh, there's a lot of buying demand out there. You've done hundreds of meetings over these last six plus months. Uh, what would you like to say about where you expect the share price to open up? Well, sure. It's it's been an amazing ride, first and foremost, um, since October when we spun it out officially out of Orin. You know, it was it was really a concept. Didn't have a, a CEO. It was you know some high grade on a, on the right belt. It's come a long way, and there's been incredible advancements technically. And we got an amazing CEO here with us. Uh, Peter um, did a remarkable job with probably I don't know two three hundred Zoom meetings with the the time it took us to get public, which was an extra few months than we originally forecasted. And so we just use that extra time to get extra ready and not just with our project and do more work and build our confidence, but we did it to really uh, set ourselves up to perform out the gate. And, you know, why are we so ambitious? Why are we so excited? This truly is the number one exploration shot I think I've ever seen on, on a virgin project that's never been drilled before. And from that perspective, you know, I get the same question you just asked, Peter, where does it open? What's it going to trade? Look, all I'm going to say is we funded it at a dollar. 14 million shares roughly were purchased at a dollar a few months ago, right? So that gives you a bit of a base of where it should trade and above because that's a, a large commitment of that price. But at the same time, you know, this is something that everybody should own if they like huge discoveries, if they like that risk versus reward, that big return potential. You, you just got to own this regardless of price, at least some of it in your portfolio before we get the first real results back. So for me, you know, it's it's open range. Um, I, I'm actually was was along the whole listing process. I was more concerned about drilling than I was about the listing process because even if we didn't get listed for another six months and we drilled and hit it, we'd still reward shareholders the way they deserve to be rewarded. It just would have been done via privately. But that was just a, a modest stepping stone, barely a milestone compared to what we're going to do with the drill bit here. And so I've been anxiously you know, pushing the listing with Peter and however I can help. But more anxiously, I've been following the project with extreme you know, anxiety and in a good way of, of what we might be up to. And you know, you get this fantasy kind of perspective when you see the grade and you see the targeting and there's still a lot of layers that haven't come out on this project which you'll see in the coming weeks here as we're going to start drilling it that are pretty paramount towards the, the probability of success which which we think is quite high 
Ivan, you did a recent interview with Rick Rule uh, about Tier 1 Silver and your exploration thesis. And as Rick Rule has taught me and thousands of other speculators, we're to look at exploration as getting answered to unanswered questions. And it's important what questions you come up with because you don't want to waste your time and money. And, you know, the knowledge and expertise that goes into developing these questions. Are there new questions that your team has developed over the last six to eight months as you've been unlisted? Well, I would say we know the right, the simple facts, right? We know there's grade. We know there's scale. We know the address is right. We know the age of mineralization is right. Those are the top four things you worry about from a high level. And those are all 10 out of 10 check marks for us. But we don't talk, we haven't talked a lot about the multi-phase. You know, if you think about that nucleus or that target below surface that's pulsing this veins up to the surface, it's got four or five different times that it pulsed veins that have crossed other veins and means that the, the, the actual system is pulsing high grade repeatedly over a longer period of time, which gives us a really high level of confidence that there's a large amount of veins and it's a very robust system. That's a big one. The second thing is when you look at our chargeability in geophysics, we were going through a call with one of our very, very good shareholders and a consultant who works with us the other day. And we're going through the drill plan and one of the holes crossed our targeted feeder structure and it went for another three, 400 meters. So we turned to Dave Smithson and said, Dave, why are we drilling way past the feeder structure? This gentleman, Chris uh, Hensley asked us and Dave said, look, he says, we've sampled 40 gram gold, et cetera, on top on the backside of that feeder structure. And we see other structures behind it. And my question was, why doesn't that show up in the chargeability? Because there's low sulfide on the Western half of the actual target. So sulfide is what shows up in chargeability. Sulfide can include silver and gold, but we're getting that really bonanza grade silver and gold without high sulfide content as well, which begs the mystery and a bit of the fantasy of what are we going to find with that drill bit? How many targets, how many veins, how many structures are going to be mineralized when we drill through them? So I, I like to think our targeting is only scratching the surface and you know, you're going to have to give it some time. But these are some of the things that have not been asked that are paramount. And the last question, which nobody's really asked us formally yet, is how come this opportunity was never found before? And whenever you hear of something that sounds too good to be true, this great, huge target on this belt, like a perfect case scenario, which is what it's advertising as, why didn't anyone else find this? And that was asking the same call. And Dave explained there's a thin cantina, like a layer of dirt that covers all these veins that he's been sampling. He sampled, he sampled over 1,500 veins carrying this ridiculous grade, right? And what he said is, if you're not closer than a meter to see these veins, you can't see them. They're covered by this layer of dirt. But once you get closer into a meter, you start to see these veins. You, you take your rock hammer out, you start hammering away, and you get rock that geologists describe as FUBAR. Pardon me for the, the acronym, but really messed up rock which means there's a lot going on. And in big systems, you want to see that massive distortion, huge heat engine, a lot of different events, twisting the rock, turning it. And that's really, really positive for the endowment potential of precious metals. So from that, I think that the market doesn't know yet that the, the, the reason why this was missed is because a thin blanket of dirt that's covered it and nobody gave it the close attention. Wild Acres, the junior who had this before us, who had the bit of the high grade, they were exploring on the part that had low sulfides. So they didn't get to all that high grade, multi kilo, a bonanza grade to the extent we did. So there was a miss by the predecessor that went ran out of money in the last bear market. And then thirdly, you know, seeing the multi events that form the system, it's a pulsing system over time. It gives us the chance to, to believe that this, there could be a lot more here. It's not like a single event that created some thin veins that have occurred. So, you know, I think I think all of that is paramount towards what's not been asked. That's that's as important as what we've told you about. I also think that trenching, which Peter can tell you that that news time is going to come out in the next few weeks here. I think trenching has been missing because people want to see widths of economic widths of potential mineralization. And this project advertised as no outcrop of significance, just in veins kind of piercing through the surface. But um, the guys have gotten onto some outcrop. And so uh, I think the next week or two, we're going to have some veins coming out, or sorry, some trenches coming out, which hopefully give us some of those widths that we'll want to see and, and drill holes down below. Peter, can you talk to us about news flow as Ivan brought up and how connected are you with the assay labs and when should investors expect a turnaround of these results? Yeah, news flow is going to be 
you know, rampant in the first couple of months, it's going to be really exciting. So, you know, investors have waited so long for us to be listed, uh, you know, foreign shareholders and, and, and those that took part in our financing. And so, you know, in the meantime, we haven't just been sitting on our hands. We've been working and, and especially the group down in Peru, you know, bulldozers are in place, excavators, excavators are clearing the pads, drills are going to be ready within 10 days from now to, to, to start piercing the ground. So we're going to come from listing our stock today to commencing drilling within 10 days. We have news flow from uh, trenching, uh, more samples coming out and potentially more zones that we've discovered. Uh, not to mention, you know, let's not forget our, our, our game plan with tier one is, is we're a portfolio company and we have results to come back from, from our other assets as well, which are extremely high quality. So, so we, we have a, a ton coming down, down the pipeline and uh, investors are going to be, they're going to be uh, well in tune with all the news that we have to come. 60 days. Would that be a fair estimate for when we could see the first core results back? Yeah, again, sorry, I didn't touch on the on the how fast the labs are coming back. But actually, in Peru, funny enough, it's the one thing that is very efficient. And so our geologists are, are saying, you know, two to three week turnaround times, you know, I always like to, to uh, err on the side of being conservative. So, you know, two to four weeks for, for results to come back from those first holes. So that's extremely fast compared to, you know, some of the things that we're seeing in, in, in United States even. But just if I could clarify that for investors, does it take a week to drill a hole, then two to four weeks for you to get it back, then your team has to look at it before you issue the release. So maybe like five to six weeks, would that be the expectation we should set? Four to six weeks still is reasonable, including that drilling holes three to four days, depending how, hopefully it takes a lot longer to drill the hole and we've hit the big porphyry underneath the precious metals, right? But um, four to six weeks is good guidance for the holes. You know, the next question that you, you'd ask generally is, are you going to batch it? Are you going to do one hole at a time? Um, you know, all of this will come out as we start drilling it because we have to learn our drilling pace uh, until you drill it. You don't know how fast, how many meters you're going to get a day. We have an idea. And uh, once we do that, but four to six weeks is very fair guidance. And, and then the other thing I'll say that I want to just pipe in on, and sorry to interrupt you, Peter, there is um, this project is not going to be determined in one drill hole as a miss. It's going to take at least 20 or 30 drill holes to tell us it's not there, you know, which is a lot. That'll take us probably a good six months to the end of the year to figure out, you know, and, and at the same time, if we drill the glory hole on the first day, our lives could all change significantly, you know, within four to six weeks, it could be a whole different world for us. You know, this, for an exploration investor, this doesn't get any better, you know, a virgin project, amazing concept, all the right ingredients there, and a lot of ways to make it work and very few ways to kill this. And then the last point I'll make is we've only explored one third of the property. And there's a lot of prospectivity in other parts of this property. Nobody realizes that, because we've got into such a big 20 square kilometer, you know, bullseye of veins emanating from a source, but there's two thirds more to go look at. And we are on that belt with some of the world's largest porphyry deposits within 30, 40 kilometers away. Peter, the Peruvian election, as we speak, it's still up in the air, neck and neck. Uh, what concerns have investors been posing to you and what is your thoughts on the election? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're watching what's happening in Peru right now, you know, all day, every day. We have teams that are very connected to the political scene uh, in Peru. So we're able to get firsthand and not just, you know, rely on clickbait from the North American media that always likes to, to throw their throw their spin on everything. You know, it, as Ivan will tell you, and in his past experience with, with mining in, in various countries that have political instability, um, you know, it, it's what makes this game tough, but it's what makes the, the risk reward really pay off. So, uh, you know, in Peru specifically, um, you know, there are a lot of concerns and, and rhetoric being flown around about uh, the intentions of, of Mr. Castillo and, and what he wants to do. But guess what? The election isn't over yet. There are still hundreds of thousands of votes to be counted from uh, expatriate bo votes from outside of Peru that heavily lean to to the other candidate, Keiko Fujimori. So, you know, there's going to be accusations being slung back and forth. There's going to be uh, contested and disputed votes. So, you know, we really think that there's, there's going to be at least another week before, you know, we have anything really definitive to, to rely on. In the meantime, we're watching it closely. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, do we feel that Pedro is a is a massive threat to an explorer in Peru? No, we we don't at all. Um, you know, he came out of the gates pretty hard, uh, 
you know, swinging from the left-hand side. However, he was very clear that he does not intend to have any nationalization of any uh, mines in Peru. And, and most likely, you know, they're just looking for uh, a bigger piece of the pie. And so whether that comes in taxes or royalties, but really affecting, you know, the, the larger producers in the company. Um, but, you know, thankful for us in a state that we are fully funded with full permits in hand and full support from our communities is, is a huge plus for us. Um, so where, where all systems go, our focus has always been Curabaya. It's always been, uh, um, you know, having the drills really tell the, tell the truth on this thing. And, and that hasn't changed one bit from, from what's happening in the background with the election. Ivan, as we wrap it up, would you like to share any final thoughts? Yeah, just just on that, Peter touched on my experience, international experience. Uh, I've done business in Mongolia. I've done business in Ghana, West Africa, and Ghana was interesting. The government took ten percent of your project from day one, so they had a ten percent carried interest, meaning you you did all the work, you spent all the money, you got to keep ninety percent plus you paid taxes, right? They also had a three and a half percent NSR, and we were successful with Keegan finding 5 million ounces in that environment. And the stock went from 50 cents to $9 per share, $900 million market cap at the time. So if we can do that in that environment, which is far more challenging than what we're talking about in Peru in terms of current layout and what might change, that's really positive. Secondly, elections are great. They, they draw a lot of attention. There's always, I mean, as we're seeing here, there's a lot of drama around them because the world's going through a lot of change. It just went through COVID. There's going to be a global taxation effort that's going to be across all industries and all people. And we're all prepared to face that. Um, I think specifically for Peru, you're looking at a, a deadlock, really divided, really, really tight race, which I think predicates on minimal change, no matter who wins, because they won't have that landslide overwhelming control. And I think so it's it, it's kind of over overdone on the drama down there. Castillo made some remarks in his preliminaries and it scared a few people, but the, the marks Hamala made in the last election were much more aggressive and, and nothing got really that bad. The permitting slowed down a little bit. We don't think that could be much slower. However, we're navigating appropriately. And if you listen to Castillo and what he's advocating for, it's to do more for the communities. And that's something we've done incredibly well from the start, not just on uh, tier one, but on uh, Sombrero. We put the communities first. We treat things socially with sustainable long-term views of having a mind based on our confidence. And if we're going to make the effort everybody should benefit. And I'm actually in favor of doing more for the local people that are affected by the mines. I'm actually supportive of that. So the last point I'll make is the word tax. And the reason why I love and hate the word tax, hate the word tax because I have to pay a bill, you know, but the reason why I love it is because I'm making money when I have to pay tax. And so you either want to make a lot of money and pay a lot of tax, or you don't want to make a lot of money and don't pay a lot of tax. I'd rather the first of those two comments. So I, I'm not afraid. I know Nevada recently is, is making an effort to increase their taxes. That's in the US. That's one of the best, that's the best mining jurisdiction in the world. I think we will see it, you know, where it can be applied globally on the backside of COVID. I think there's going to be, you know, a definitely a new landscape for all of us, but it does not change the scarcity of big discoveries that's become way more difficult to find. And so metal shortages, metal prices going up, taxes going up. It's a very, very interesting place. As an investor, are you going to be penalized more by increased taxes on the company that's exploring? Or are you going to benefit more because no one's finding what we're looking for, these world-class, huge, major, you know, 20 to 50-year mine life type of projects, right? And I, I'd go and say that if we make the discovery, the taxes, everything is going to be fairly irrelevant fairly quickly in the sense that it's so hard to make these discoveries. It's so rare to find them. The value and premium that is going to be applied is going to be substantial. And I don't see Peruvian government, whoever wins it, I don't see them blowing them, their foot off with a shotgun by collapsing the favorable foreign investment climate that they currently have. I see adjustments as we're seeing in Chile. But again, I don't think a country with the history of mining that they've had where they haven't punished any companies to that extent or nationalized previously, I don't see anything like that on the horizon. And I, I refer back to we're trading now and we've got a drill turning next week. If we felt there was any kind of serious risk as prudent business people, we would pull back and wait, but we're not. We're going full steam ahead and we have that confidence. And you know, we're trading now and family members are accumulating shares. And that's that's where my family's at today. 
They're doing that with the political in the background. They're doing that with everything going on. And they they wanted they wanted some shots of this thing because we think that's been given a lot of attention for good reason, but we don't think it's going to be as bad as advertised going forward. Thank All you. right. Well, you got a new ticker symbol to add to your investing apps. Add TSLV, which begins trading today. Again, that's on the Venture Exchange in Toronto. Hopefully in a few weeks, we can update you with what the OTC ticker will be. As a, That's of interest to me. Also, as an American investor, website is tier1silver.com. Sign up for the notifications. As you heard today, there's going to be a, not, a lot of news flow over the weeks and months to come. Ivan, Peter, thank you for coming on the show and providing this update. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Bill. Thank you.